Let's take our Bibles and open to Psalm 25. If you'd like to stand with us as we read. We've had some folks on the back standing up, but nobody else has been standing. But I haven't told you to stand. But if you'd like to stand, you say, why are you telling us to stand? Well, that's normally an indication that I'm going to be long-winded. <laughs> Because this year might be the last time you stand for a long time. Psalm 25, we'll begin in verse number 1. My text is going to be verse 17, but let's begin in verse number 1. Psalm 25, 1. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee, let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O oh, bring me out of my distresses. Look upon mine affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they that hate me with cruel hatred. O oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. Look back in verse 17. This is my text. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Brother Aki Grant, will you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message for us? Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I think we could all agree that we are living in perilous times. And this is a great psalm, really, when you think of it, especially the last part of the psalm. If we break it down, look down in verses 14 and 15, you'll notice his difficulty. You'll notice his desolation in verse number 15, his distress in verse number 16, his disgrace even in verse number 17. And at verse 18, rather, his disgrace, his, his sin, the danger in verse number 19. So you see this progression and you see the cry of the Psalm of David here. Verse number 1, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And really verse 17 to me is a good verse because I think it can apply to us in this age of panic. And that's really what's going on today, especially how the world is pushing things. They have to find something to panic over. And panic always distorts your discretion and your judgment. And so I want to preach along this subject, verse number 17, making a mountain out of a molehill. And you'll notice here he says, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. So I want to get some biblical help, if we can, this morning for the trouble in our lives. We have a lot of Christians that are like, they say, they're jigsaw Christians. When they're faced with a problem, they fall to pieces. <laughs> you know, they're jigsaw puzzle Christians. And oftentimes it's so easy for us to buy into the panic and to fall 
to pieces. There was a woman, she was having trouble going to sleep at night. She was always worried about a burglar breaking in. Anybody like that? By the way, if you got a gun, it's no good if it's not loaded. Amen. And it's no good if it's not by your bedside ready to go. Amen. I'm glad we're not in Canada yet where they have gun laws. If you have a gun, if you have the registration and all that, you have to keep it locked up within the safe that's locked up. If they ever find it out in your house, they confiscate it. And so no need to have a gun if you can't get to it. But anyway, she was so worried about burglars and she just fretted over and she'd stay awake at night. Any little noise, she would get her husband up, go check as a burglar, go check as a burglar. She's always looking for a burglar. Well, about 10 years of this went on. And finally, one day it actually happened. She heard a noise. She said, go check, go check. And he's like, I was in a good dream. You know, what are you doing? Go check, go check. He gets up. He goes downstairs to check. Sure enough, turns the light on. There's a guy in there raiding the kitchen breaking in and the guy turns you know and he says hold on before you do anything I want to go get my wife so she can meet you she's been looking for you for 10 years <laughs> now I want to talk about trouble this morning first thing I want to say is there is a thing as actual trouble there is real trouble there's the fact of trouble problems and trouble are real uh, one good thing about having trouble in your life and problems it lets you know that you're still alive amen uh, people out in the graveyard, they don't have any trouble. So if you're having some problems, you're still breathing. You're still kicking. That's a good thing. Uh, th there is real trouble. There's the fact of trouble, but then there's the fear of trouble. And we'll get into this a little bit later on, but more people than not allow the fact of trouble to bleed over and become a thing that keeps them doubled over in fear. How do we face trouble? Well, I think we need to face it head on. In prayer, like the psalmist does, when the psalmist is dealing with something, whether it be an enemy from the outside or his past and his sins on the inside, he takes it to God. He says, Lord, I'm lifting up my prayer and my trouble to you. Amen. So face it head on and say, God, here's what I'm facing. This is my problem. This is my trouble. Psalm 34, 6. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. I read of a family that had a uh, son that was not just disabled, but he was handicapped to where he couldn't even feed himself. I mean, he was basically an invalid. He lived to be 32 years of age every single day. He had to be fed by hand. His parents had to feed him and take care of him. Someone asked the father, they said, how did you, get, how, how did you go through this? And he said, well, every day I would wake up, and the, man, the young man's name was Oliver, and he would say, can I feed Oliver today? Can I take care of Oliver today? And, of course, the Lord would say, yeah, you can take care of him today. God gives you, you have a trouble for today, you need to take that day and that trouble to the Lord. Just face it and take it to the Lord. And then we have what I call abstract trouble. We have actual trouble, but we have abstract trouble. This is not really a problem, but it is a perceived problem. You know, you can uh, have a perceived problem or something that you think is wrong, and it can bother you just like something that really is wrong. You could get a phone call... And on the other end, someone can mention some tragedy taking place. They might not mention a name, but they might mention she was in an accident and they begin to go through this and then the phone gets cut. Immediately you're thinking about your daughter or your granddaughter. And you're beginning to put two and two together and you're thinking, oh no, and you're beginning to, all of a sudden you're sick. You ever get bad news and all of a sudden you just get sick? It just hits you in your gut. But let's suppose that was a wrong number and they were calling someone else about someone else's granddaughter. The very same emotions, the very same response immediately before you find out once you call back and realize, oh, I had the wrong number. How many has gotten a call at 2 o'clock at night before and it was the wrong number? I've gotten those. Immediately when the phone rings at 2 o'clock at night, I'm thinking somebody just died or somebody's in the emergency room or something's going on. And immediately your adrenaline kicks in, you get ready for that news, you start shaking and you prepare for it. And then it's, you know, is Mildred there? That's what I, we, we get a call a lot of times from Mildred, I think. Like, no, ma'am, you have the wrong number. <laughs> 
But the same response takes place even though it's an abstract, it's not a reality. It's a perceived problem. Mark Train said, worrying about something is like paying interest on a debt you don't even know you owe. Worry. Perceived worries, and then we have potential worries. In other words, it's not a complete non-reality, but it's a possibility. You know, there's a possibility you could trip and fall when you leave here. And some of you that have some handicap issues, that's a higher possibility than, than not. However, you could drive yourself crazy thinking, you know what, I might trip and fall, so I'm just going to sit right here. I'm just going to stay here all week. Preacher, can you bring me some food? You can't live that way. You can begin to think about the potential problems. You know, there could be something in these chemicals. You ever get a, uh, a donut and it looks the same as it did three weeks ago? Donuts don't go bad. Wonder why. What is in that Krispy Kreme? And you begin to think about all these ingredients. You look on the back. We were looking at Clorox wipes or some kind of thing, and it, it gave these ingredients and all this stuff. You know, Then it said 98% other ingredients. Uh, 98% other? What is it? Strychnine? <laughs> you could just, and, and you begin to think, yeah, any of you ever get prescription from the doctor, first thing you do is read that big long thing they give you at CVS? No. The first thing you need to do when you get that, you throw it in the trash can. Because if you read that, you will drive yourself, you'll never take the medicine. I don't know if we should take it anyway, but... <laughs> so, potential worries... According to the National Bureau of Standards, a dense fog covering seven city blocks to a depth of 100 feet, if you take that dense fog that's that spread out, it would compose less than one glass, eight ounce glass of water. That's how potential worries become. They just spread out and spread out, and the more you think about them, the more rabbit trails you run, the more you worry, you worry, you worry. You see the text, the troubles of my heart are what? enlarged, gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's potential. Yeah, it could possibly be. Now somebody said you can have permi permission to worry if you meet one of these seven things happen to you. Number one, your birthday cake collapses from the weight of candles. That's a reason to worry. Number two, you turn on the news and they're showing emergency routes out of the city. That's a good reason to worry. Number three, your twin sister forgot your birthday. <laughs> Number four, your car horn goes off accidentally and remains stuck as you follow a group of hell's angels on the freeway. <laughs> that might be a reason to worry. Number five, the bird singing outside of your window is a buzzard. <laughs> Number six, your income, check, your income tax check, or what would they call these things, the stimulus checks? Your stimulus check bounces. That'd be a worry. Number seven, your wife says, good morning, Bill, and your name is George. <laughs> but, you know, we have potential worries. We make mountains out of molehills oftentimes with things. You know, a little kid, he can think a monster's under the bed. He has a perceived worry, so there's something you have to do. You have to give biblical counsel, and you have to, have to, have to get them into reality. And so the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. We have to try to assess the situation properly and try to take in facts, not fiction, and then make our evaluation and our discernment and our judgment based on the facts. Um, and once you turn the lights on, you show the little kid underneath the bed there is no monster, hopefully they can understand that reality and be able to turn the light off. Philippians chapter 1 verse 10, Paul said that you may approve things that are excellent. So we have abstract trouble, those potential things, those perceived worries. Then we have, finally, this is where I really want to preach on, amplified trouble. The text says in verse 17, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. They're, they're genuine troubles, but they're just enlarged. So it's real trouble, even bad trouble, but it's trouble that is worried over excessively. What does the scripture say in Philippians? Be careful for nothing. Now Paul writes that while in jail. Be careful for nothing. 
So Paul would have to say, I'm not going to be full of care. That's what careful means. In other words, to be full of anxiety, to be full of worry. Paul's like, I should not be full of care even about my jail sentence, even about the fact that I could be facing the chopping block. That's a pretty strong scriptural admonition. You say, preacher, I just got a bad diagnosis from the doctor. Be careful for nothing. That's still in the Bible. But by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Here's the key to that thing. It's like, y'all remember as a kid, you get on the little, uh, what do they call those, seesaws? Is that what they call them? Those are fun, unless you get on the thing with a fat kid. And then he jumps on it, and you go flying about 15 feet, and then you fall right on the thing, man. But you get on it, and when one goes up, the other goes down. So they have, you have to have both of them. So this thing with worry and anxiety, the way to bring the worry down is to bring the prayer up. So if you're praying about everything, it will, it's just a natural law. It tends to push the worry down. Just like in our psalm, he starts off, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. He starts off bringing it to God. You bring it to God, you're praying about it, and you're pushing the worry down. But if you don't pray about it, the tendency is for the worry to go up. So we have this trouble, this worry. The Anglo-Saxon word is where worry comes from, and it means to strangle or to choke. That's what worry, to be choked out. An old Swedish proverb says, worry gives a small thing a big shadow. Is it in the wintertime? I can't ever remember the summertime when your shadows get longer. The wintertime, I think. Brother Jeff, you're supposed to know that one. You know what I'm talking about, how the shadows will be a whole lot longer and it looks real big? Worry will make a small thing a big thing. Chronic worriers often worry about things that they don't need to worry about. That's a habit. And so he says, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. Somebody said, worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Uh, years ago, Brother Jeff took the youth up to the Little Grand Canyon up in Georgia. And you get up there and you think, oh man, this is some natural wonder. I bet it was formed over billions of years and all this kind of stuff. And then come to find out it wasn't too many years back that the thing was formed. And it had to do with bad farming practices with the farmers. And how the water will begin to run. And that little stream begins to trickle and it begins to carve. And the next thing you know, it becomes a big, large chasm. Troubles can be enlarged. And that's exactly what the text is dealing with. Somebody said, a day of worry is more exhausting than a week of work. You know, worry will wear you out. You ever get concerned about something? And man, it will physically... There, and I'm not a, uh, a psychologist or anything, but physi there's a physiological uh, truth to this. This will affect your body. The things you think can affect your body. The Bible says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dry off the bones. It's good. You ever have a ba be good belly laugh? Any of you ever have a good belly laugh sometimes? <laughs> Oh my goodness! It just makes you want to laugh. And when you laugh, it just, it, it kind of releases that serotonin or whatever's in you, you know, kind of like when you eat dark chocolate. You know, it just feels good. And uh, it releases that in your body, that chemical, and it, and it makes you feel good. And of course, some people are trying to dope themselves on, you know, excessive comedy and they're just out in the world and they don't have any truth. But as a believer in Christ, you need to take things the way the Lord takes them. You know, the Lord doesn't take, take a lot of things as serious as we do. Amen. And we need to sometimes begin to view things the way the Lord sees them. Let me say this. We've been praying for the rapture for a long time, right? Amen. Every time we pray, we, we're like, Lord, even so come Lord Jesus. I love to hear some of these guys pray, and they'll be like, Lord, come back. You know, I, I like that. I pray that too. But I think in our mind, we're thinking we're going to cruise along just like everything is, and we're going to, have, we're going to be wealthy, healthy, wealthy, and wise, and then the Lord's just going to come and take us on to heaven. But it may not be that way. It may be that some things have to take place as far as our prosperity and as far as our freedoms. By the way, you do not have freedom of speech in America. I hope you know that. 
That is a true fact. You do not. You can cuss Jesus Christ on the street corner and won't go to jail. You can. You can get on TV and cuss Jesus Christ, cuss God, and cuss the Bible, and it will not be considered a crime, but you can say other things and it be considered a crime. Now, what did we expect? We've been praying for the rapture. What did we expect? Why are we so upset about it? Especially if we lose the red, white, and blue, if we lose the freedoms and so forth. What do we expect? And really, is it that big of a deal? In the whole scheme of things, is God really on pins and needles about the state of the great republic of the United States? I don't think so. When I read the Bible, the nation of Israel is the apple of God's eye, not the United States of America. So let's uh, keep our perspective biblically, a biblical perspective. Worry is a terrible thing. Soren Kierkegaard, the old philosopher, in his portion of the book, The Concept of Dread, he said this about worry. No grand inquisitor has in readiness such terrible tortures as has anxiety, and no spy knows how to attack more artfully the man he suspects, choosing the instant when he is weakest, nor knows how to lay traps where he will be caught and ensnared, as anxiety knows how. And no sharp-witted judge knows how to interrogate, to examine the accused, as anxiety does, which never lets him escape, neither by diversion nor by noise, neither at work nor at play, neither by day or by night. That worry and that anxiety, it will just rend you. Constantly in the back of your head, it will be carving. And in your brain, the scientists tell us that, you know, you, you kind of program your brain. Like when they have a stroke, they have to reprogram the other side. And they have to, they have to cut those channels out. And you, kind of like the old records, you have those grooves cut in your brain. And that worry, it begins to carve that thing. And even though you may be doing one thing consciously, subconsciously, you can allow that worry to keep interrogating you, to keep torturing you. A thing can be enlarged. You say, what's the biblical counsel? Romans 8, 15. For if you not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. God does not want you to live in fear. Yeah, you might have trouble, but God's bigger than the trouble. Amen. 2 Timothy 1, 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All the water in the world, however hard it tried, could never, never sink a ship unless it got inside. All the hardships of this world might wear you pretty thin, but they won't hurt you one least bit unless you let them in. Christian, you've got to be determined to be singly minded. And you've got to be determined to shut some of this world out. And you've got to focus on Jesus Christ and on the truth and not let this stuff torment you. God gives us power to conquer our fears. 1 John 4, 4, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This world is in panic. they got to find one more thing to panic. They find this to panic on, that to panic on. Panic for the riots for a while. Riots die down. Let's panic back on the virus for a while. That dies down. Let's panic on the elections for a while. Let's, die, let's find something to get all in turmoil about. God says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How come Christians have the same spirit of panic and fear that the world has? My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Now, I'm not telling you to walk around like a, like a foolish person and, you know, the simple believe every word and just walk on through and fall into a ditch. But you don't have to live panic-stricken. Does God not control your circumstances? Amen. Amen. Charles Schultz, Schultz, you know, the peanuts guy, he said this, don't worry about the world coming to an end today. It's already tomorrow in Australia. <laughs> He's given us a spirit of power, a spirit of love that calms our fears. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. God is love and God wants us to love him. And if your fellowship with God is right, it will calm and abate your fears. And then he gives us a sound mind to commit our fears to him. Isaiah 26, 3, this is a good verse. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Your mind has to be stayed on God. You know, we need to, uh, 
We need to step up to the plate as Christians and discover some things about God, be interested in God, be interested in the Bible, and grow closer in our fellowship with God and let that drive us instead of all the stuff that's going on in the world. I'm not saying that you, you know, go dig a hole in the sand, but in some respect, we need to enjoy our relationship with God and chase after and follow after God. Like David said, my heart panteth as the, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. Distractions. We have a lot of distractions. Now we are to think and let the facts sink into our emotions to help us dispel our fears. In other words, filter your mind. Filter your mind. He said, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. But the rest of the prayer in verse 17 is, Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Now notice in verse 17 how he calls it his distresses. There may be some trouble out there that's affecting you. But how you allow that trouble to affect you is another thing. There was a, uh, a truck driver that had taken a new job, and just because of how the industry is, you have to drive with another driver, even though you may be experienced. So this one guy, he had been driving trucks for about five years. He took a new truck driving position, and he's driving with this guy. So he's got to train with this other guy. This guy had been a truck driver for like 30 years. So they're going on their route, you know, so on and so forth. And the young guy that's training, he's driving along. He goes about five hours, and he's, he's, he says, man, man, can you take over? I'm tired. He says, okay. He took over. So the older guy gets in. He drives. He goes for about 12 hours, you know, just goes and goes and goes and goes. They finally stop, and the young guy wakes up or whatever, and he's like, man, how in the world can you go so long? He says, well, it's a little bit different, young man. He goes, uh, I used to have the same problem you have. He goes, uh... I used to say when I get up in the morning that I was going to work and tell my wife goodbye. Now when I get up and go, I tell her I'm going for a country drive. He's riding along just working, 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 just taking a country drive. When you get up and go to work or you do whatever duty you have that God has assigned for you, and by the way, we've all been chosen, whether it's your job or whatever that you do, that's where God has you. And so enjoy it. Do it for him. How are you viewing the trouble in your life? That's the thing. But oftentimes we take that trouble and we enlarge it and it becomes our distress. It's amazing with all the conveniences now, we're busier than ever. I was hearing one preacher and he was talking about, you know, Job had all those camels. He called them Camelacs. Instead of Cadillac, he had the Camelacs. And he said it was funny that the devil was walking to and fro, but Job had camels. The devil didn't even have a camel to ride on. <laughs> but you know, we're going to and fro. We're so busy. And if you keep up with the world and try to keep up with all the changes and everything that's going on, it, there's something about it that's just a force that's moving and driving and changing. And there's a danger in that it will literally wear you out. And so we have to view life different, I think. In conclusion, I'll read from Isaiah 65. A good perspective for us to take. And this goes along with John's vision in the book of Revelation. Verse number 16. Isaiah 65, 16. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. I can't quote the song exactly, but it's one of the songs I like to listen to. It talks about the troubles that we cry about down here, up there will only bring a smile. A song, Until Then. I think the name of it is Until Then. The things down here that brought you tears and brought you worry and anxiety, you're going to get up there and say, why in the world did I fret over that? The Lord had it all planned out. He had it all under control. And all things work together for good to them that love God. I enlarged that. I, ma I made a mountain out of a molehill. For what? And so I think we definitely need some biblical help with that. I want to close with this story I read about a man. 
and uh, his name was Michael, and this other gentleman had grew, grew up with him, went to high school with him, and this, this young man was always just optimistic. You know, some people are just, some people are more um, pessimistic, and some people are more optimistic. And some of that is, I think, genetics. Some of it is, you know, obviously uh, just personality. Some of it is just you choose to be a, a, a mully mouth. You choose to be an Eeyore. You know, just Eeyore. You know, you never see your glass is always empty. You know, your tires are always half flat. You know, whatever. Uh, everything's always bad. You know, you just choose to see that. But this one guy, he was just optimistic. He was just always encouraging no matter what happened. As a matter of fact, after the, these two men, after they even got out and began to get into their careers, this young man, Michael, he even encourages other guy to quit his job and go into business for himself. He's like, look, you can do it, man. You're young enough. Go ahead and do it. Just give it a try. And he did, and he became very successful. He moved off and so forth. They lost touch. Well, many years had went by, and they finally... Uh, got back where they could, you know, see each other again and came back in contact. And he had heard this young man, Michael, had been in a bad accident. So he went, he wanted to meet up and go see him and so forth. And he had fallen from a communications tower 60 feet and just about died. So he went over to see him and visit him and he was recovering. He was at home. He had recovered. They had had all these surgeries. He had recovered. He was at home. And one thing that the young man always used to say, and he remembered this back in high school, he'd say, how you doing, Michael? He says, he'd say, if I was any better, I'd be twins. <laughs> You've probably heard that saying before, you know. Brother Peacock always says, I'm finer than frog hair, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, just little phrases. But this guy said, if I was any better, I'd be twins. And so he went to see him, you know, he was at home recovering. He was still pretty banged up, but he was doing better. He says, how are you doing, Michael? It's been a long time. He goes, if I was any better, I'd be twins. <laughs> he said, tell me about your accident. He goes, you want to see my scars? He started pulling up his shirt, showing him his scars. And he says, what happened? He says, well, you know, he fell from this tower, communications tower. He's laying there. They're coming to get him. And uh, once the, they, the paramedics, they get him, they get him into the place and begin to treat him. He can look at their faces, and he can hardly communicate. I mean, he's like half paralyzed. And he can see that they're looking at him like, this is a lost cause. Like, they're looking at him. He thought in his mind, they're looking at me like I'm a dead man. And so, finally, they're, they're beginning to work on him, and the lady asks him as she's getting ready to get his, his IVs and everything hooked up, are you allergic to anything? Please tell me, are you allergic to anything? I mean, they can kill you. You know, if they give you something. So they're trying to find out real quick before they get all these pain medicines. So he got up all the breath he could get. And he said, gravity. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they all, they got him, you know, they, 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 they took, you know, they started laughing, you know. And then he said, and he got more breath up. He goes, please operate on me as a man that's going to live, not as a man that's about to die. And he chose, he said he made up his mind, he chose he was going to live. And of course he wound up living. And that's, you know, kind of a cool story to think about. And a lot of times you see people in situations when they're fighting cancer, when they're fighting bad odds, their attitude does help them. You say, well, in the end, you look at the years, it didn't really give them that many years. Yeah, but it might have gave them some quality years. Because of their, they wasn't walking around saying, I'm dying, I'm dying. Everybody's dying. One bad thing about cancer is when they say, okay, you got two years, you got five years, they bring the black cloud over you. All of us have a black cloud over us. We're all dying. We just don't know the day. And really, even when you get cancer, you don't know the day. Don't live as though you're dying. Live as though you're living. Don't let those troubles enlarge in your heart. There are two days we shouldn't worry about. Yesterday and tomorrow. Amen? Amen? All right, Psalm 25, 17. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Deliver me out of my distresses. I hope that helped you this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the scriptures. Lord, we know the world's in a panic, and if they're not panicking about something, they're going to find something to panic about. God, I pray that you might help us to calm our fears by trusting in you. Lord, I pray that you might encourage my brothers and sisters. There's no doubt there's actual trouble that we're all facing. I know some trouble is perceived trouble and, and trouble that we've, we've come up with, potential trouble. But, Lord, we know there's actual trouble. There's real problems. And, Father, I pray that we commit those problems to you. 
Help us by everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let our requests be made known unto you. And we thank you that the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep our hearts and minds. God, I pray that you might encourage my brothers and sisters. Help us, Lord, to uh, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Help us to maneuver in the situation we find ourselves in. I pray for our families. I pray for those that were mentioned this morning that are sick, those that have ailments, those that we know that are struggling through even spiritual difficulties, that you might help them and encourage them. Lord, help us as a church. Help us to keep the main thing the main thing to focus on Jesus Christ. And Lord, even so, like we always pray, even so come, Lord Jesus. We pray it in his name. Amen. 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 You're dismissed.